Hi, everyone. My name is Jen Sharon, NHIA's Chief Operating Officer and your moderator for today's Open Access Talk Infusion webinar, COVID-19, What the Home and Specialty Infusion Community Needs to Know. Before we start, I want to say a few words about our recent decision to cancel the NHIA conference. Clearly, this was a, the right decision. However, we understand how important the conference is for keeping our members informed and connected. NHA is working on plans to bring the valuable education content from the conference to our members. As you're probably aware, this crisis is inspiring creativity. Once we determine how best to push the content out while allowing for social distancing, we will update everybody. Thank you to our provider and supplier members for your understanding and support while we adjust our plans. Just a couple of housekeeping reminders. The presentation is available for download from the handout section of the navigation pane. This webinar will be recorded. A link to the recording will be emailed to you following the conclusion of the webinar and will also be available via NHIA's website within the next 24 hours. Following the presentation, we will have time to answer your questions. Please submit your questions via the question tab in the navigation pane at any time during the presentation. Now I would like to introduce today's presenters. We have Dr. Amorosa, the Medical Director for Penn Home Infusion Therapy and Professor of Clinical Medicine, Infectious Disease and Division for the University of Pennsylvania. Abby Roth, Director of Learning and Development for Critical Point. NHIA's President and CEO, Connie Sullivan. NHIA's Senior Vice President of Reimbursement Policy, Bill Noyes, and NHIA's Director of Legislative Policy, Shay McCarthy. Before we get started, NHIA's President and CEO, Connie Sullivan, would like to say a few words. Connie? Thank you, Jen. As of this morning, the United States ranks eighth in the world with over 7,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19. Worldwide, over 200,000 infections have been identified and more than 8,000 have died from complications of the disease. These are unprecedented times and each one of us will be impacted in some way by this pandemic. I believe the home infusion community will play an important role in treating patients at home who are either recovering from infection or avoiding the risk of becoming infected by the virus. In addition, healthcare resources are becoming increasingly strained and providers of all types are being forced to adapt. Therefore, the goal of this webinar is to help home infusion providers understand their role in preparing for outbreaks of COVID-19 and a possible influx of patients into your site of care. And if, you're not, if your area is not directly impacted, you will learn how to support those who are by conserving critical supplies. NHIA has assembled a team of presenters to bring the latest information on COVID-19, compounding guidance for conserving personal protective equipment, as well as an update on NHIA's legislative and regulatory efforts to expand home infusion services to Medicare beneficiaries. Thank you again for taking the time to join us and your NHIA team will continue to provide additional information and support in the days and weeks to come. With that, I will turn it over to our first presenter, Dr. Amorosa, thank you. Thank you so much. It's really a honor and a privilege to speak with everyone today. Um, shall I say next slide? So just to review the definition, so a pandemic, I think probably we all know what a pandemic is, but to be clear, it's a disease affecting all people and all populations, right, widespread and out of control from the Greek term pan, meaning all demos people. And then there's other outbreak terms that come up, an outbreak, an epidemic, and a disease that is endemic in the population. So it persists over time. And those are just some other terms that have come up in the context of, of this pandemic. Next slide. So this is an old uh, designation, but I think it's useful because I think there was a lot of talk like, why, why haven't we called this a pandemic even a month ago? And if this was the type of framework that was used back in the 2009 flu pandemic, you can see phase six there is increase in sustained spread in the general human population. That was sort of the WHO definition of pandemic. Um, next slide. 
a couple years ago, they sort of made a more fluid definition. And I think in the context of this fluid definition, um, it became less objective when one could say there is a pandemic. And at a certain point, I think with this COVID-19, things became very semantic. And, and I think by the time the WHO said, okay, there's a pandemic, I don't think that that was a shock to anyone. But certainly at this point, uh, sustained transmission all throughout the world absolutely fulfills the pandemic definition with COVID-19. Next slide. This is a picture of sort of a schematic of a coronavirus. And so there's these spike proteins, which are those three little clubbed proteins that are all over on the virus. And then under there, there's an envelope. So it's an enveloped RNA virus with spikes all over the surface. You know, it looks not super unlike an influenza influenza uh, virus. Next slide. Um, and I'll go over a little bit in terms of sort of the, the picture and how that's relevant to what we're thinking about when we're thinking about patients infected with coronaviruses. So coronaviruses are a huge family of virus that are really sort of widespread in the animal kingdom. And in particular, there's many species that are uh, have been discovered in bats. There's different genera, and among the genera, there's several, uh, four identified coronaviruses that cause common cold in humans. So there are two alpha genera and two beta genera. And then we have these three very serious beta coronaviruses. There was the SARS virus. This is severe acute respiratory syndrome virus that was uh, caused the outbreak um, back in 2002, 2003 that originated um, in China. And that was a lineage B beta coronavirus. And I'll say why that's relevant. And then there's the Middle Eastern coronavirus that emerged um, in 2011 in the Middle East. And now we have this SARS COVID uh, coronavirus 2, the same lineage as SARS coronavirus, uh, the original SARS coronavirus. So they, they share some characteristics and, and we can use some of our knowledge of SARS to impact uh, some of the things we're doing with SARS-CoV-2, which is uh, the next slide. So how did this virus emerge? This is just as by way of background, probably review for most. Um, 2019, December, um, an outbreak of several cases of severe pneumonia, and China had already developed a system to try and rapidly identify new pathogens causing unknown severe pneumonia. So they sort of alerted that system, and they early on, they had been suspecting a coronavirus would at some point potentially cross again into the human population, as did SARS and MERS. So they used um, molecular testing and specifically for coronavirus virus primers in addition to likely other primers on a bronchoalveolar lavage and they identified a uh, beta coronavirus that again was very similar to the SARS coronavirus although luckily much less deadly than SARS coronavirus and then quickly uh, identified the fact that this virus could spread person to person based on the epidemiology of what was being seen there. Next slide. So then later in the month, the WHO sort of uh, gave the moniker COVID-19, standing for coronavirus disease discovered in 2019, caused by this SARS uh, coronavirus 2. And again, so how does this virus cause disease? These surface spike proteins that we saw in the schematic attached to a target on that's concentrated on our respiratory epithelial cells, this ACE2 receptor. And then after that, the virus fuses with our epithelial cells and enters our cells and continues its life cycle. And importantly, potentially for therapeutics, the virus uses um, some of our own enzymatic machinery of our cells in order to do this viral fusion and go on with its life cycle. Next slide. So how does COVID-19 spread? So the mechanism of, of, of spread is inhalation of droplets in the air. And then if there are droplets on surfaces, which any object, a fomite, and we touch the surfaces and then touch our eyes, nose, or mouth, we can auto-inoculate ourselves with the virus. There's been talk and concern that the virus could be spread through aerosol uh, analogous to 
varicella virus um, or you know tuberculosis, for instance. Uh, there was a study, and I put the graphic from the study that was published um, in the last week in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, that's been a lot in the media that you know the virus can remain airborne um, for three hours uh, or more, and um, this would be impactful if the if the virus could be sort of spread in that way. Now, looking sort of at this study in detail, they aerosolized the virus and then watch to see how long it would last in the air. There's no data to suggest that routine patients when they're coughing and sneezing are aerosolizing this virus. However, um, certainly when we interact with these patients and generate aerosols such as suctioning and um, manipulating airway, we have to sort of keep in mind that the virus can be aerosolized in those way. So overall, this notion of the aerosol um, airborne transmission seems pretty unlikely because it looks like each case of infection is infecting on average potentially two to three subsequent cases, whereas if this were to be really airborne, we'd expect it to be more on the order of the secondary cases that are seen or with measles, like, you know, uh, 20 cases or more from a single case. Um, but nonetheless, it really does give us caution, certainly when we do anything that could generate air. Aerosol. Next slide. So again, we think it's droplet spread, although we can aerosolize this virus, and then in that context, it can be airborne. And how do we sort of spread this? What contributes to its transmissibility in a given patient? This is all still being worked out, and I fear sometimes that some of the things I'm saying today may be wrong tomorrow, but sort of what we know now, or what at least what I know now, and some of you all may know new things from this morning that can correct me, um, the factors are the severity of the illness in the patient. Patients who are ill tend to be shedding high loads of virus and can be highly transmissible. Um, you know, how much they're shedding really is sort of a chief determinant. And then if we're exposed to somebody who is pre-symptomatic, they may have the virus present, but potentially at lower levels. And um, how are we exposed to them? It appears that very casual contact, um, certainly if we're at any distance from a person, we're much less likely to um, be exposed and infected with the virus than close contact. And even among close contacts, there was a study um, from the people who, who sort of came back from China to the US into their households and the CDC followed them very closely last month. And there were one in 10 household members got infected from the patient who sort of came back infected. So, um, you know, not encouraging that like nobody in the house is going to get infected, but very encouraging that um, it's a relatively low number and particularly likely to be much lower if you follow some strict precautions. And the CDC actually has very good guidance on within a household how to prevent um, subsequent members of the household for, from getting infected, such as not sharing bathrooms, bedrooms, utensils, cutlery. It's pretty sort of rigorous guidance and maintaining six feet. And I've been sharing that guidance with many patients um, who have been concerned. And in the context of the sort of CDC guidance, they've um, made a hierarchy of sort of what constitutes a high risk exposure, medium and low. And some of their, um, their tables are very useful sort of to help um, you know, inform risk of patients or uh, healthcare workers, certainly, who have been exposed. Next slide. Um, this has also been something it's been in the press really recently um, from that same study where I showed the aerosol. This was how long can this uh, virus survive in the environment on various surfaces. The blue is the old SARS from 2002, 2003. They, they did the study in parallel with that SARS and this SARS, and this is is our, our COVID-19 is the red. And so you can see, you know, quickly the viral level diminishes on all surfaces. However, sort of most concerningly, the plastic, it can survive up to, you know, on the order of uh, um, more than a day and into two days. And so that's sort of, you know, where this notion comes that, um, you know, we, we really sort of have to continue to maintain um, wiping things down and and it's sort of not enough to say oh well somebody was in there with this yesterday probably the virus is dead which honestly would have been how i would have thought about this um, with a normal enveloped virus but it seems to be hardy enough in the environment that um, it can live on surfaces and there's many caveats to this this is a very um you know the way they they put the virus into the particles and everything else may be um, an overestimation in how how long the virus could really live on surfaces in real life next slide 
Um, this is just to get at this notion of the incubation period, and I'm not going to go over this table in detail, but it was a very sort of cool study in that we knew exactly when people were exposed because they had traveled for one day to Wuhan or had one day of contact with a symptomatic patient and then were able to be followed. And so the bottom line is the incubation period for this virus on average is five to six days. Rarely is somebody uh, symptomatic or shedding within two to three days, and very rarely would it be longer than 14 days after exposure. And so the notion of this 14-day self-quarantine after exposure makes sense based on the data we know. Next slide. This is a figure from a similar study done at, uh, from Johns Hopkins, sort of looking at the average incubation period. You can see sort of right in the middle there, about five days. And I think most interestingly here, one day, two days, three days after exposure, people are not um, uh, you know, exhibiting any symptoms of the virus, which means you know, if, if I'm exposed to this virus today and then I go see 15 more patients today, I really am very, very unlikely, it doesn't even seem feasible that I would expose those patients to the virus. And so this is something that certainly has come up a lot with healthcare workers. So you, you have a little bit of time after exposure before you need to truly worry that you've, you've uh, exposed anyone else. Next slide. So what about this issue of spreading virus when you're not symptomatic? Again, been uh, high in the news lately, and there's clear uh, documentation of people who have transmitted the virus um, pre-symptomatically or asymptomatically, which makes it certainly from a public health point of view more difficult to control because if you quarantine everyone who's symptomatic, you may still not be um, quarantining everyone who may spread disease. Uh, next slide. I'm not going to go over this next slide in super detail, um, but it's an interesting study of, again, a visitor from Wuhan to another city in China who was totally asymptomatic, was at a conference, had dinner, shared uh, you know, family style with uh, two other colleagues, went back to Wuhan, and two days later got symptoms. So at that dinner where he was thoroughly asymptomatic, he infected two other folks at the dinner um, who then went on to infect asymptomatically other members of their families who were tested. So, you know, again, it sort of highlights the notion that um, you can potentially spread virus even pre-symptomatically or asymptomatically. And, um, you know, a close dinner like that, I can imagine there was likely to be uh, fomites and, uh, you know, touching eyes, nose, and mouth, of course, and sort of that highlights sort of how we can prevent this from an infection control point of view. Next page, next slide. So what is the clinical manifestation? Manifestations of this. We know there are patients who are, can be thoroughly asymptomatic, and it seems to be the younger one is, the more likely they are to have very mild symptoms. So there's, there's a preponderance of people who have very, very mild disease, nonspecific respiratory symptoms. This, these uh, data that I quote on percentage of fever, this is amongst folks admitted into the hospital. Amongst healthy in the community um, who get infection, you know, it may well be less. Um, however, the predominant three symptoms, fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, and then less commonly headache, sore throat, very uncommon uh, rhinorrhea, and then GI symptoms are seen in some people, but they're pretty uncommon, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea in less than 55% of the time. In the subset of people, and again, this is enriched in older individuals who go on to have severe disease, the classic uh, things that people are saying are severe pneumonia, respiratory failure, and then shock with multi-organ involvement and ARDS. And in terms of the classic lab abnormalities, it really seems to be consistently cytopenias, but lymphopenia in particular, it seems to be a bad prognostic sign and seems to predominate. Next slide. This is just to highlight what are the risk factors for severe disease. Again, age is the greatest risk factor for severe disease. And this is a little bit older data from China, but it really sort of highlights this linear association um, of, of mortality with age. And then the other conditions that have been associated with higher severity, um, hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease, and then certainly all the other organ um, diseases that we see um, higher morbidity and mortality with 
in, for instance, influenza. So COPD, renal disease, malignancy, immunocompromising conditions. Um, that being said, the hypertension diabetes piece here is out of proportion to the increased risk for of those comorbidities that we see in patients with influenza. And so there's really more to be understood as to why um, those conditions in conjunction with old age put people at higher risk for severe disease. Next slide. So how do we diagnose this? Certainly it's very nonspecific, overlaps with a lot of other respiratory infections. So in the right setting where um, one is suspicious that there's disease around or you know there's disease around, it's very reasonable and appropriate to send a patient with some of these symptoms for lab testing. The labs that are um, you know, sort of ramping up now are molecular assays. So they're real-time PCR, genetic amplification. And again, there's like, talk that they're not sensitive, they can't roll things out. These are, I, everyone I've asked, highly sensitive, um, you know, molecular assays that detect down to like way less than they need to. They detect down to like 20 copies if you get a good sample. And so the appropriate sample is nasopharyngeal plus or minus oropharyngeal swab, nasal aspirate, sputum, or bronchoalveolar lavage. And as we know, if somebody's asymptomatic and has been exposed, and say, they say, I want to test to know if I have this. If the test is negative at that point, given they're still potentially in the 14-day incubation period, that doesn't rule it out. And they, that's not going to sort of allow them to go back and um, get off of self-quarantine. So the timing of the lab testing, particularly in this context of the you know, lack of widespread availability of testing, um, is important in terms of knowing how to interpret a negative result. Next slide. So how do we prevent infection? I think this is important to us as healthcare workers, um, just in terms of us getting infection, spreading it to our other patients. Certainly preventing all non-essential contact with patients. I mean, this is being done in the hospitals. They're canceling surgeries and, and really, really um, digging down in areas where uh, we see disease uh, to limit were um, uh, any sort of non-essential workers, non-essential visitors. Um, in our hospital, we've eliminated all visitors except for like very exceptional circumstances. Um, and then screening, screening patients, recognizing there may be patients who are pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic, but if the screen includes, you know, travel to areas, that travel guidance is changing every day because, you know, a week ago people weren't potentially including New York in the travel questionnaire, whereas now we are, contact with anyone with known or suspected uh, COVID, and then symptoms. So cough, um, we know a lot of our patients don't have thermometers in the home, so we've really broadened our sort of fever definition to just have feeling feverish or chills, any of those things. And then, of course, in our home setting, we're screening household members as well, not just the patient. So, you know, if you end up having a private, uh, positive screen when you're calling a patient ahead of time, then sort of knowing what to do with that and, and, and developing a, a good scheme and a protocol for you know, how to sort of bounce that up and figure out how to triage those patients and who absolutely needs to be seen and who we can get more information on, obviously, is keeping all of us very busy um, right now. And, and I think the right way to do that is always very much an evolution right now. Um, the other piece of this is we're noticing some patients are like, no, don't come into my house. I don't want anyone in here right now. And so really sort of navigating um, patient preferences in regards in particular to non-vital services. Um, we've had some patients, you know, if they have heavy packages, they want the driver to bring that in, all their TPN. Other patients may say, please leave that on the uh, porch and I'll sign the manifesto and give it back to you. So it really sort of, we want to really sort of empower the patients in terms of um, what, uh, what, you know, they, um, they can, they can do with this. And then sort of anticipating a lot of other scenarios will come up. Patients will say no, no, no to the screen. And then, you know, they may sort of be coughing their head off in the house and figuring out what to do um, and, you know, stepping out and, and calling for help are, are sort of things we've been trying to anticipate. Next slide. So personal protective equipment, um, PPE, I think that this is not a, a and, and new to most of us. Um, so as we talked about droplet and contact because uh, the, the virus is spread by droplets and then we touch things and that's sort of the contact might piece. Um, in symptomatic patients, as we know, um, a lot of the 
pieces of this PPE are having really widespread supply chain shortages. Um, in the context of when you're generating aerosol, the recommendation is airborne precaution. So this would be an N95 respirator or PAPRs um, if, if you have them in your practice. And then for routine care, the recommendation is droplets, you know, uh, droplet precautions with surgical mask. And, um, you know, we, we have been going back and forth with this when we, we haven't really been taking care of many diagnosed patients in the home yet. And when we do, we're planning to really limit the amount of time we spend in the home to what's essential. And we're likely, if we can, going to have N95 or PAPRs for those patients, recognizing that may be beyond what's done in hospital settings. Um, and then in terms of the eyes, face shields or goggles as eye protection, and certainly in a symptomatic patient because of this fomite issue, gowns and gloves. Next slide. Um, so just like a scenario, this is, you know, I think probably many of us are getting called with these 30 times a day. So a patient is on the screen. The nurse says, well, the patient's um, uh, father is COVID-19 positive. So what do we do? So this patient is effectively on self-quarantine. And so we really have to limit any non-essential contact and keep six feet away if possible. So if we don't need to really go in there, you know, we have to sort of scrutinize that. And then... Um, we have to educate the family, as I mentioned, on sort of how to prevent spread and, uh, you know, continue to screen that patient to see that they're not manifesting symptoms prior to each of our contacts. So, you know, the guidance would be they're asymptomatic, um, but nonetheless, they could have asymptomatic spread. So we're going to wear a surgical mask and goggles and gloves because we're in the home. And this is sort of CDC guidance. And try and keep the family member out of there unless they absolutely have to be there to educate the pa patient or something. But certainly with a diagnosed family member, you don't really want them in there at all when you're there with the patient. And then of course, if the patient becomes symptomatic, you're gonna have to consider um, testing and, um, and uh, you know, dressing as if they are infectious with a gown and gloves as well. Next slide. And here's some good CDC guidance, both on the PPE and sort of what to do and what constitutes an, constitutes an exposure. Next slide. Um, I think it goes without saying to everyone, I'm just gonna put up here, hand hygiene is really vital. And um, given this virus can exist in the environment um, on surfaces, alcohol-based hand sanitizer, soap and water, and avoiding touching eyes, nose, and mouth. Next slide. So treatment, I'm going to just go over very briefly. I made slides yesterday morning, and they were out of date by yesterday evening. So this is changing, and I'm hoping these slides aren't like already obsolete. Um, so the what's sort of informing treatment is the Chinese experience in vitro data in terms of um, you know uh, drugs that may be active against this virus, and then extrapolating from the 2002 SARS um, experience in terms of what drugs were a bit active then. Next slide. So in terms of treatment decisions, you know, again, everything's in evol evolution. Um, at this point, the general recommendation is to not treat mild disease because patients do great. And so this is, you know, more than 80% of people are just going to be minimally ill or going to recover and they don't need any treatment at all. And so really sort of stratifying who to treat based on hospitalized, not hospitalized, hospitalized with comorbidities such as, for instance, advanced age or diabetes that might predict a worse outcome. These are the patients that one would target for therapy. And certainly patients who are critically ill are also the ones in whom we're going to consider using um, the TRI therapeutic interventions. Next slide. So some of these agents being used, so um, probably all have heard about this remdesivir, which is an IV nucleoside analog that um, in the context of a clinical trial, and of course there's always exclusion criteria, or an emergency um, new drug application to the FDA um, can be gotten from Gilead. Um, probably uh, variable how easy it is to get that you know, over the course of, of time. Um, the other interesting drugs that seem to be active, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, um, with hydroxychloroquine generally being considered less toxic than chloroquine, um, they are active in vitro and they have some decent clinical experience in China, particularly chloroquine being 
being used with some clinical benefit. And, you know, sort of thinking about how that virus enters cells and needs um, lysosome in order to fuse with the membrane, we know that hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine inhibit acidification of lysosomes. And so that really sort of makes a biological plausible way that they could be active against the virus. Lopinavir ritonavir is interesting because a study came out in the New England Journal yesterday that suggested it was a nice randomized clinical trial that it really wasn't of major benefit used as monotherapy. Although there's some interesting lopinavir ritonavir with ribavirin data from SARS that suggested it was pretty good. So I think the jury is still out on our old HIV uh, friend, Kalitra. And then um, tocilizumab, which is used for the cytokine storm that people use, um, see with the CAR T cell therapy, is now being considered in patients who have this sort of severe cytokine storm type manifestation, multi-organ failure in the ICU. Um, I personally haven't seen this used yet, but it's, it's definitely intriguing mechanistically that this could be helpful. Next slide. Um, oh, this was just a sort of a scientific uh, in vitro study suggesting that chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, um, you know, certainly have in vitro activity against the virus. Next slide. This is from um, Penn. You know, Penn is not the, the end all on this, but a lot of institutions um, have these like brainiac pharmacists who are really scouring the literature and figuring out um, what's happening in China, what's the best thing to do in terms of potential therapies. And this is one that um, came from our institution that the website is down there and it's open if, if anyone wants to look. I think that they're actually updating it again today. Next slide. This is just an example. So a clinical situation, the treatment consideration. So somebody's mild, you're not going to treat them. If they're hospitalized and you're worried that they have severe progression, um, hydroxychloroquine, and then all the sort of um, toxicity and monitoring considerations you might have there and dosing. Next slide. Um, so what's not recommended? This is, again, also an evolution. So it seems like a consensus that corticosteroids could increase shedding, and unless you need to give them for some other reason, not a good idea. Ibuprofen, this seems to have changed like overnight. The WHO yesterday was saying to avoid it because of this hypothetical um, thing where it can increase the ACE2 receptor expression on airway and maybe cause more severe disease, but apparently that's been redacted this morning. So um, I don't know where we're going to go with ibuprofen. It seems cautious if you don't need it to avoid it um, in terms of treating the fever. Um, and then antibiotics, it, it seems like there's a percentage of people who will get bacterial superinfection, probably less than 20% of people. So antibiotics for all is probably not beneficial here. And then there's tons of controversy on ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers um, for a couple of reasons. One, there's this thought that these ACE2 receptors in the um, lung are upregulated in patients on ACE inhibitors, so that could make them have more severe disease. And then the observation that people with hypertension, uh, which is not usually a classic risk factor for infections, have worse uh, infections in China. And so I think that right now the cardiology associations are not saying like take your patients off ACE inhibitors, um, but there's there's probably more to come in terms of our understanding um, because we know obviously overall they're such beneficial drugs. Next slide. Um, and this is just one example, like of so, sort of the special populations. Once we end up having uh, and taking care of patients who have diagnosed infection, have sort of been through their infection, you know, there's going to be different scenarios where we're going to have to consider. So, for instance, you know, China's been there already. So, cancer management in COVID-19 patients. So, this is just some of their recommendations: postpone surgery, uh, counsel the patient because they're going to have a ton of angst about postponing, you know, therapy and then resume therapy once they're stable. This is analogous to what we do with other infections in cancer patients and, and defer anything that's not absolutely essential in terms of infusions. Next page. Um, so just to summarize, obviously we have unique considerations in terms of both protecting healthcare workers and caring for our patients in the home. And I'm hoping that as we have more access to rapid diagnostic testing, it's sort of going to help us in terms of both um, knowing how to see our patients, what PPE to use, um, conserving our PPE, and certainly uh, as we develop a better understanding of this disease and its interventions, um, recommendations are going to change over time. And that's all I have. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Abby. All right. Um, thanks for having me also. I'm going to be going through some more information on what will be going on actually in the pharmacy as far as what we have GARB available for compounding in and what um, kind of things we need to look at from that standpoint. And really at this point from a, a lot of what we've learned over the last couple of days and weeks is that uh, really our current supply has, has dwindled quite a bit as well. Um, and we need to try to, if we can, order what we can order, especially with hazardous garb as well, um, and really be conservative with what we have. And if we haven't started doing some really strict conservation measures, we need to do that immediately. What I want to really emphasize, though, is that you need to evaluate the alternatives that I'm going to run through here and other things that are out there and available information-wise and implement the best strategies for your organization. There's not going to be a one-size-fits-all solve for this. You might have more of one piece of garb than what you have of something else. Um, and a lot of this is going to require us to be a little bit creative about what we can do and really just use some good science and common sense to get us to the point where we feel comfortable um, with being able to care for patients from a you know compounding standpoint. So what I'm going to be sharing now is some information that had been um, shared by Critical Point, and I also have some updated information as USP had released some information and guidance on garbing and the preparation of um, excuse me hand sanitizer. So. Um, kind of keep in mind that that's where we'll be coming from with a lot of this because we've never been here before so a lot of this is just going to be some some opinion next please so when we talk about conserving garb we really need to look at our workflow and our process so think about how many people are normally in your compounding area can that be limited in some way can we staff a little bit smarter and really one of the big pieces to look at is what we can do to maximize the going in and going out of the compounding environment. So can we get people in there and have them stay in there for a longer period of time and better utilize things like pass-throughs um, or if we transfer things through our anteroom, do a better job with the cart transfer and really getting in what people need so that there's not that in and out and back and forth uh, through the environment. Next, please. One of the things that is major right now is the availability of face masks. So really consider prior prioritizing those masks for the frontline healthcare personnel. If we have regular face masks that are available to us, that's an option. N95 respirators, if you have them available, are an option. Please keep in mind that I'm coming at the use of N95 respirators from a different angle than Dr. Amorosa was. She was talking about it more from on the front line with patients. I'm talking about us using this as an alternative to our regular face mask um, as we're compounding. So that's why the note is there about it doesn't need to be fit tested because at this point we're looking to protect the CSP from us, not protecting us from you know a patient. So. I do also want to share that the USP released some information yesterday, and I think I did note this morning that their links to that were available on the NHIA website as well, so you can um, check there to, to look for this particular information. USP has recommended and advised to not reuse face masks. They've provided guidance on using a clean fabric to cover the nose and mouth, so some kind of uh, fit washable face mask or a bandana, and the idea is to have this be clean each time that you enter the compounding area. What I'm gonna caution you on here is you will need to come up with a process and procedure on how to make that happen. So what are the risks for laundering these face masks at home? Do we know that everyone in that household is healthy? Um, so you're gonna have to evaluate what is clean, how you're going to put a process around laundering, and then also how those items are going to get back into you know, your facility. Do they need to come in in a clean plastic bag? Do they need to come in in a clean container? How is that process defined? And at this point, there's not a whole lot of answers for that. It will be up to you to look at that and determine what is going to work best for your organization. Next, please. 
shoe covers, uh, we don't recommend the, the reuse of shoe covers. Sometimes people want to turn them inside out as an option. What would be a much better choice is to implement some kind of facility dedicated shoes. And USP had also provided that as guidance. So look for something that is going to be dedicated to the pharmacy offices um, and not like hospital dedicated or building dedicated. So something that's going to stay as clean as possible. And then shoes that might be washable or cleanable. So maybe something that doesn't have laces, something that you can wipe or wash the outside so that you now have some shoe that is cleanable and dedicated to your particular environment. And then again, put some sort of process around that so that everybody is maintaining their shoes in the same way. Next, please. For gowns, if you are currently an organization that never reuses a gown ever, um, and that's a, a best practice recommendation that comes from critical point, you're gonna wanna start reusing immediately. And based on USP's uh, document that came out and um, our recommendation is that if you can only reuse it for that one day, one shift, please try to do that. Um, Cause that is currently allowable within uh, the current version of USP 797 as long as that particular gown then is hung up on the clean side of your ante room or hung up within your perimeter if you would have a segregated compound area. So really, um, it's about how you're going to treat that gown. Um, ideally, if we can cut down on the number of people that have to enter the facility, that is better. Um, if you feel that you have to continue to reuse disposable gowns, our recommendation would be no longer than a week. Um, but that's something that you would have to evaluate. Another option is the use of non-sterile sleeves, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And if the, gar the gown is uh, soiled in any way or is used for cleaning activity, that disposable gown must be discarded. Next, please. USP guidance that came out yesterday yesterday um, did provide us with some additional information and they provided some guidance on reusable um, and like launderable garb. So having something that's a clean, washable and dedicated non-disposable garment. They mentioned gowns uh, and also lab coats. We think about lab coats, that could be a good option. Just still be thinking about something that is closable at the neck if possible and if possible, has elastic at the sleeves. That's gonna help with our, our gloves staying in place. Um, the other thing to make sure of, if it's possible, is to have some kind of long sleeved garment. And if that's not available, then sleeve covers um, is, an, is another option. These will have to be laundered as well. So again, same as the face mask, you'll have to come up with some sort of process on how these items are going to be laundered. Uh, other things to think about with this is there are places out there that provide uh, launderable garb and actually like clean room grade garb, which places like Cintas or Aramark, but you're going to have to see what's going to be available and whether or not they would even be able to provide garb at this point because I'm sure they are stretched right now too with what they have available. Uh, next, please. To touch on the sleeve covers now, as we um, see obviously the disposable gown supply dwindle, um, reusing or using sleeve covers is a nice option, especially if you're having to reuse gowns, um, or as it was mentioned from USP, is that if you have a short sleeve gown. Um, they do not need to be sterile, so don't worry about buying something that's sterile because we would not normally do that for garb in our clean room environment anyway, except for gloves. So what you want to look for for this um, is something that is made out of a, like a Tyvek material or like a non-porous film product and stuff that has elastic around the, the um, ends so that it can be uh, enclosed similar to what we would have for gowns. Most of the sleeves available um, are like that. So definitely sleeves are an option at this point if you're forced to reuse a gown or you have um, short sleeved. Uh, gowns or lab coats that you need to be wearing as an alternative. Uh, next, please. Wanted to just provide some guidance on this. Um, there's some confusion uh, about how to kind of go about doing this because sleeves are not something that we normally wear ever. 
Um, so please go through your regular hand hygiene and garbing process. Um, you know, you go through your ante room, you get your gown on, and you would enter your, your buffer room. Most places will put their gloves on in the buffer room. Some won't. So it's up to your facility, but I'm basing it on the fact here that um, you're going to don your gloves in your buffer room. So you walk in with your gown on, whether or not it's a laundered gown, um, a short sleeve laundered gown, or a long sleeve disposable that you had to reuse. Remove the outer packaging from your sterile gloves and your sleeves. Apply the alcohol-based hand rub um, to the hands and wrists and allow it to dry. And I'll get the hand rub in a minute. Hopefully that's available to you that you have that to be able to use. Um, and then you would don the sterile sleeves and then we're gonna don the sterile gloves over top of that. So it's kind of the same mindset that if we weren't using the sleeves at all, where our gloves would be over top of our gown sleeves, we're just going to don the gloves over these sleeves. Next, please. One of our other challenges now will be getting out uh, of the clean room environment and trying not to contaminate it anymore, especially if gowns are being reused or if we're using vulnerable gowns that um, maybe are not low linting or low shedding. So what we want to try to do is remove those as slowly and as carefully as we possibly can. If you can and you have a return on your clean side of the ante room, you can stand close to that return to doff that gown. That's going to help kind of keep the, the particles from your skin or from the gown going all over the room. And just be careful that you're not trying to remove a gown or hang up a gown um, close to a sink where somebody might be splashing water. So a lot of this reuse is going to be based on kind of the area that you have available within your ante room to be able to hang gowns up. Um, especially if you're a place that doesn't normally reuse gowns, you're going to have to consider how you're going to hang them, where you're going to hang them. Hopefully you have the real estate for that. Um, and you know what your potential options are. All right, next please. From what we've been told and what I know from having talked to some suppliers of sterile gloves, they're not expecting that supply to be affected. I haven't heard anything of this point yet, but as we've uh, been learning over the last couple days, things change very quickly. Um, so typically the gloves are not coming from a location where things have been affected from a production standpoint, but that could definitely change. Um, but from what we want to do at the very minimum out of anything is try to ensure that we have sterile gloves available to, to use from a, a compounding standpoint because touch contamination is gonna be our biggest concern when it comes down to it. So having sterile gloves available is gonna be the most important thing. Okay, next please. All right, so the alcohol-based hand rub has definitely been a challenge. Um, purchasing it uh, outside, you know, for home use versus what's available from a healthcare perspective. Um, so things to think about and what you can consider is try to conserve this for possibly just a glove change only. So maybe instead of doing your regular hand hygiene procedure where you wash your hands, then do the hand rub, and then don gloves, if you've already washed your hands, you can use you, you can consider just washing hands, donning gloves, and then conserving hand rub for in between. Now, as I mentioned, USP had provided some information on actually compounding hand rub. So if that's a route that you choose to take um, and you can prepare some and have it available, then by all means um, do that. But if that's not something that you're gonna consider doing, you'll have to come up with a way to uh, think about hand hygiene and conserving. And if you don't have any hand rub available at all, that might mean that in between glove changes, your best practice could be to actually go out to the ante room, doff your gown, and rewash your hands. So that's going to have to be a choice that you make based on your facility's um, situation. And next, please. Okay, I am going to spend a bit of time on this slide, um, just going over through over some things as far as just good work practices and your SOPs. And hopefully you have instilled within your organization the idea of thinking about contamination control 
and doing that through hand hygiene and garbing, material handling, and just overall good behavior in the, the clean room. And if you set those fundamentals and that foundation for your organization, this lack of garb availability and, and having to move to things that might be vulnerable or particulate shedding really shouldn't impact your organization at all. So, you know, the hope is, is that within your, your organization, everybody is truly dedicated to really good clean room behavior and good aseptic techniques. So the reminders here are just to walk slowly and deliberately through the compounding area. Um, the quicker you walk, the faster you move, and the more movement that you make is going to really increase the chance um, of, you know, skin shedding, particulate shedding, an increased risk for microorganisms in the environment. Um, so really good work organization is going to be important here, making sure that you're moving everything in that you need when you need it so there's that less need for a, a back and forth. So really good good staging and, and work organization. Also things that are going to be important here is um, material transfer into the PEC and actually also the room as well. So if you can do a really good job with material handling in your organization, that's going to help from the standpoint of limiting the contamination risk. Um, so we also want you to think about sanitizing, you know, the deck frequently, your staging cart and other high touch um, surfaces as frequently as you can, because those are really going to be the hot spots for microbial uh, risk contamination and transferring all of that potentially into the primary engineering control. Also, I know it's sometimes hard, but really focusing on not talking while compounding. And that's something that we recommend just normal on the day to day when we have clean face masks that we can toss when we're done. But at this point, while we are either reusing face masks or going with USP's recommendation of a launderable face mask, um, it might not contain particulates as good as we would want it to. Um, so limiting talking while compounding is going to be very important so that we're not really exhaling into the primary engineering control that we're working in. Please also think about not touching your mask and touching your face um, because if you have to readjust that mask, uh, you're going to potentially contaminate your gloves, and then we need to sanitize gloves. And some people that I have talked to are now on a shortage of sterile alcohol. So it's going to be important that we really think about not touching things unnecessarily. And then the best that we can with frequent re-sanitization of your gloved hands um, and being sure that you're keeping your gloves as clean as, as possible. Um, some of that might, again, be a challenge, especially if you're having problems getting sterile alcohol. Uh, some of the other options for that um, would be then conserving that sterile alcohol to just what it's needed for, like glove sanitization, the inside of the primary engineering control, and critical sites. So if you typically do material transfer with sterile IPA from the outside in, please consider using a different agent to wipe off material to transfer into your clean room suite. Next. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abby. We're great information. Now we want to hand it over to Shay McCarthy, NHIA's Director of Government Affairs. Shay? Great. Thank you, Jen. Um, and with sensitivity for the time left on the webinar, I'd like to keep this section relatively brief so um, we can take some questions towards the end. But I do want to take this opportunity to let everyone know how we're liaising with Congress and the administration to make sure that appropriate policies are in place to allow the federal government to really leverage the benefit of home infusion in responding to this public health crisis. Um, the message that we're bringing to Congress is really twofold. Well, firstly, for, for patients that don't otherwise need to be hospitalized but do need IV medications, the home is not only their preferred site of care. In the context of um, this virus, it is the best site to protect them from the threat of this spreading disease. And so given the fact that home infusion providers collectively have the capacity to treat hundreds of thousands of 
additional patients, we think it's important to help people recognize that in addition to protecting these patients from the threat of disease, home infusion providers have the ability to help relieve capacity from hospitals and uh, other sites of care that are already being overwhelmed with coronavirus patients. And that's a message that they've been receptive to on, on Capitol Hill and has been an important part of how we're helping people gain an appreciation for the value of home infusion um, in this time of critical need. Moving on to the next slide, um, both the cost effectiveness and patient preferences for home infusion has been something that has long resonated with policymakers on Capitol Hill. Our research has shown that up to 95% of patients prefer to receive their treatments at home to the extent that they are uh, uh, good candidates for that care setting. And commercial payers, despite the shortcomings of Medicare reimbursement, are increasingly relying on home infusion. And there's an important study from the Government Accountability Office that Congress heavily relies on to inform their thinking on this kind of policy, which is really important um, for Congress to keep in mind. Um, as considering the fact that as healthcare costs are going to be incredibly high over uh, the months ahead with unprecedented stress on the healthcare system, uh, the home provides a cost-effective site of care for patients who need uh, IV and subcutaneous medications. And that's particularly important for patients who are enrolled in Medicare when it comes to their own individual out-of-pocket costs. In Medicare Part B, for example, there is a 20% coinsurance payment for um, all care, and so considering the fact that home infusion is significantly less expensive than hospital-based care, it's just one more strong reason to encourage patients that no need to be hospitalized to otherwise receive their care in alternative settings. Um, with respect to the next slide, I, we get just briefly into some of the legislative history and implementation, and sorry if some of this is uh, small and difficult to read on your screens, but many of you on the call are likely familiar with the fact that Medicare's reimbursement policy spurred by legislation in 21st Century Cures and the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018 has been met with an incredibly narrow interpretation of the law by CMS. CMS has, in fact, implemented this physical presence requirement that rather than the vision of members of Congress to, uh, to allow home infusion reimbursement to occur on a per diem basis, instead, under Medicare Part B, reimbursement for professional services only occurs on days when a nurse is physically present in the patient's home. And as we detail on the next slide, there is this quote towards the top of the slide that reflects the fact that this was far from the intent of Congress, and in enacting this, uh, the, um, in implementing this legislation, CMS has made reimbursement required by the bill inadequate. The immediate effect of this interpretation has been to jeopardize access to home infusion for Medicare beneficiaries. In fact, in looking at the most recently available public public data, uh, this is CMS claims data for. Um, uh, patient access to care, we've seen that there was a 20% reduction in between years 2016 and 2017 in patient access to home infusion. As we're in a time of critical need right now where it is important for every single player in the healthcare sector to step up, um, the fact that Medicare home infusion access has been flagging and the fact that this population, as far as seniors and patients with underlying health care conditions that might, other, that might qualify for Medicare under disability, it is incredibly important that they have access to the full range of health care services. To address these concerns, we've recently seen uh, legislation introduced in both chambers of Congress. This is incredibly timely, especially considering the fact that um, as designed, this legislation was not intended to address the public health crisis, but was more broadly intended uh, to promote patient access to home infusion services. And so as designed, or as drafted, I should say, the legislation introduced in the House and Senate uh, just about two weeks ago at this point would require payment to be made every day a medication is infused, regardless of whether a skilled professional is in the patient's home. Beyond that, the bill would enumerate the specific services included in reimbursement, including pharmacy services that are not necessarily performed in a face-to-face -face setting with the patient. This is something that CMS has had a difficult time understanding um, when it comes to the way that the benefit is actually delivered in practice and is reimbursed for in the commercial market. And um, 
despite strongly worded letters from Congress that has been sent to the administration urging them to revisit reimbursement, it's become increasingly clear to us that only a legislative remedy will get CMS to the point where they're able to uh, create a benefit design that is able to meet the needs of home infusion providers and to be able to treat patients that rely on these services. Additionally, this legislation is scheduled to take effect in 2021 because that is the implementation date of the, um, the permanent benefit. 2019 and 2020 are the years of the transitional benefit that were established on the Bipartisan Budget Act. Feedback that we had gotten going into the development of this legislation was because there is a lawsuit ongoing over implementation of the transitional benefit that the most uh, appropriate way for Congress to address this would be to remedy the permanent benefit. Now, of course, um, we'll get into, I'll get into in a later slide how we're revisiting that ask as far as implementation date, but as drafted, the legislation that uh, was introduced would not go into effect until 2021. Congress looks at a lot of the work they do through the, its impact on uh, budget implications, and the Congressional Budget Office is really the kingmaker when it comes to what healthcare policies will and will not move forward. And fortunately for home infusion providers, uh, CBO has had a keen appreciation for the fact that home infusion is a less expensive site of care and generates significant savings with respect to either hospitals or um, care provided in nursing homes and alternative settings. Um, this is uh, an important factor as uh, as the committees of jurisdiction try to juggle various spending priorities. It's helpful given the fact that the remedies that we're asking for with respect to home infusion actually create cost savings um, because, as CBO has recognized, uh, the home is a less expensive site of care. Now, moving on to the next slide, uh, as I mentioned, there are some limitations to the legislation as it was initially drafted. Um, we are leveraging the, the fact that in the midst of this public health crisis, it is important to, at least in the long term, make sure that the home infusion industry feels like they have level footing, which is why it's important as drafted to make sure legislation is prioritized. Presentation. So thank you so much, Shay. We will revisit it. Hello, everyone. We apologize for the technical di difficulties on the first part of the webinar. We suspect the systems are overwhelmed by the additional users working remotely. We are recording the rest of the presentation in order to get all of the information out to attendees. You will also receive information about NHI's legislative efforts and how you can help. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Bill Noyes. Bill? Thank you, Jen. Um, I'm going to review some of the COVID-19 related policies and how they affect reimbursement, um, who can bill when and where. Uh, there have been a lot of changes, including expansion of telehealth, um, the addition of some additional COVID related lab codes, um, waivers for Medicare fee for service, Medicaid, as well as some guidance to Medicare Advantage and Part T plans. Um, review some FAQs and talk a little bit about NHIA's advocacy efforts in, in this um, situation. So from a telehealth standpoint, CMS has expanded coverage greatly for telehealth visits, um, not just for those affected by COVID-19, but in order to stay in touch with their patient base that are not infected and um, alleviate the need for them to come into the hospital or physician office for a visit. Um, so in addition to the extension, the HH Office of Civil Rights also is waiving potential HIPAA penalties regarding the communication tools used for telehealth. Um, and what that means is that um, they can use common non-public video technology such as FaceTime, Facebook Messenger, video chat, Google Hangouts, Skype, and some other tools that are one-to-one -one, um, video conference communication technologies that are out there that may not meet the HIPAA requirements, but they're allowing for those to be used. They can't use non-public tools like Facebook Live, Twitch, or TikTok. Um, a couple examples that are specifically mentioned in, in the rule. The OIG is also allowed for those telehealth um, visits 
to waive or reduce the copay. Um, from a coding standpoint, really the only two codes that have um, been rolled out regarding COVID-19 are for labs, and there are two different lab codes. Um, it's possible that at some point pharmacies would get involved in um, testing or getting a sample for the labs. Uh, I understand that, that some retail pharmacies out there are getting involved, and I think that this will continue to evolve. Um, from a waiver standpoint, um, on March 13th, CMS issued a number of blanket waivers that are fairly broad, and, and they're waivers that have been issued in past public health emergencies. Um, the intent is to prevent gaps in access to care and, and to reduce administrative burden um, and focus on the care, uh, the healthcare delivery system as a whole. Um, the waivers are retro to March 1st, and they apply to Medicare and Medicaid services. There is a Medlearn Matters Special Edition 20011. This is an active link, but you can also get to this on NHIA's COVID Resource Center. Um, and like a lot, it is um, changing on a daily basis. Just yesterday, they updated this Medlearn Matters to include um, details around telehealth. Who can bill for it? Right now, it is limited to um, physician, nurse practitioners, PAs, and those type of entities. I know that um, many are advocating for that to be extended to home health, um, and as I'll discuss, pharmacy-related remote monitoring. So some examples of the waivers, um, some of which don't apply directly to us, some that do but they've waived the three-day hospital stay um, for transition to a covered skilled nursing facility stay. Um, they've waived for critical access hospitals, the 25 bed limit and 96 hour stay, relaxed the OASIS transmission timelines for home health. When it comes to durable medical equipment, I'll talk more about our advocacy efforts, but they're really based around a lack of guidance that really pertains to this public health emergency. Um, the, the guidance that's out there, again, is what they've published in the past, and that's more related to weather-related natural disasters like floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, and the like. Um, there may not be a real need to replace equipment, but there is a need for some, from some guidance as to how we can um, reduce administrative burden and help to care for those that are in the home. CMS has also released... Um, guidance to Medicare Advantage plans. Um, what Medler and Manders says is contact the MA plan for details. Um, but I've included some bullet points with the guidance that CMS provided to Medicare Part C and Part D. And I think important for our population um, is the re removal of prior auth requirements, waiving prescription refill limits, relaxing prescriptions on home and mail delivery of prescription drugs, now, expanding access to certain telehealth services, we're seeking guidance as to what exactly that means and how it would be reimbursed. Um, from a FAQ question, we've got a lot of questions as to how these waivers um, would directly pertain to home infusion services. There is a Q&A out there. Um, it doesn't really uh, assist in guiding somebody that operates in the DME POS program or the Medicaid programs as to, as to how these waivers affect them directly. When it comes to Medicare Part B coverage and supply of drugs, it does mention that the local MACs have discretion to pay for greater than 30 day supply of drugs. And I would, I would insert here, not just drugs, but enteral formula, um, where you may want to limit contact with patients and deliver more than a month supply at a time. Um, we have, as a result of the lack of information, reached out to the durable medical equipment, Medicare contractors, and the medical directors that work within, um, asking a series of questions. They are awaiting guidance from CMS, stating that CMS is looking at this as a whole, trying to affect as much as they can, but we are seeking some additional guidance. 
Uh, so from a guidance and NHIA advocacy standpoint, we're really working, as Shay mentioned, um, on part one of this call, linking the need for comprehensive home infusion coverage to the current public health emergency. Um, and we're pushing to get our legislation, that's the fix for the Medicare Part B DME infused drugs, into the COVID-19 bills. And I think there's a record number of bills being introduced and considered and passed by Congress, Congress in a very short time frame. Um, we're seeking guidance, as I said, and education from the DME Max as to how to re reduce administrative burden, um, perhaps relax some of the qualifying criteria in order to get paid for treating patients in the home that wouldn't otherwise be considered. Um, and we've sent a letter to HHS with recommendations to lessen the administrative burden and enhance um, seeking comprehensive coverage, not just in Part B DME POS, but in Part D as in dog. Um, these waivers and guidances are really up to the secretary, Azar, um, and there is a means to apply for specific waivers in addition to the broad waivers that are out there. Um, those specific waivers are, are pretty constantly changing, um, and we're reviewing them, but uh, on our website, we're gonna link to some Kaiser information where they've got an army of people that are putting these together so that you can see waivers that may pertain to your specific state. For instance, um, the state of Florida Medicaid programs have waived um, licensure within their state um, so if you're not specifically licensed within their state and you'd like to participate, you can quickly apply um, without having to jump through a lot of hoops and red tape. You have to provide your NPI number. Um, they won't do a site visit or separate credentialing as long as you're credentialed in another state to provide Medicaid or Medicare services. Uh, so that's just an example, but I expect there'll be uh, lots and lots of waivers coming down the road. So NHI's letter to HHS on the, on the topic of what it is that can be done to leverage the home site of care core competencies to minimize uh, or to maximize surge capacity in other settings, uh, we're really focused on these bullet points here. And you can read the letter on NHI's homepage or in the um, COVID Resource Center. But Relaxation of the proof of delivery requirements is one. Um, really, signature requirements of all types, whether it's assignment of benefits, um, proof of delivery, minimizing the need for contact, direct contact with a patient, whether it's handing off a pen, um, similar to food deliveries that are taking place now, where you have the option to leave at doorstep. Um, that's the type of relaxation we're looking for. Uh, allowing for the home infusion services to be to be billed each day the drug is infused and not only when a nurse is in the home. Um, something that we've really pushed for, but given this public health emergency, I think it really highlights the importance of that when you're looking to minimize the face-to-face -face interaction with the patient at, at all costs. Um, delay the rollout of prior authorization, written order prior to delivery, and face-to-face -face lists. This is something that is not out now. It was mentioned in the final rule and in our information and talking with the DME Max, it was expected to release, be released soon. So we're asking for that to be delayed. And, and that face-to-face -face piece is really the important piece is we don't wanna have to have a face-to-face -face interaction with a Medicare beneficiary in order for that physician to order um, DME POS supplies. Um, that should be able to be done through telehealth or or any other means. It isn't in place right now. We're asking them to delay any rollout of that. Um, we've also asked them to waive the enteral and parenteral nutritional support criteria um, for, for new cases so that we can quickly transition patients in need of you know, complex cl clinical support in the home. And these are therapies that aren't just um, a one hour infusion, they're infused overnight most times, over eight to 10 hours. Um, suspend audits and extend response time for existing uh, requests for additional documentation. 
extend HIPAA waivers beyond the hospitals. Um, and right now, those HIPAA waivers really relate to privacy policies um, so that hospitals don't have to um, get a signature and present their privacy policy in order to bring a patient on in any changes to those policies. But I think that um, like with telehealth, we'll see some relaxation of HIPAA policies um, or at least a notice that we will not audit you against these policies for this time frame. Um, delay of the round one, uh, the round, not round one, that was long ago, but the round 2021 of competitive bidding. Um, from a staffing standpoint in evaluating bids and following up on any documentation requirements, uh, I think now is not the time to be rolling out competitive bid and limiting the number of providers that can provide service within a geographic region. We're really look, looking to, to leverage all of the the providers to work across state lines and and limit any narrow networks um, and move towards any willing provider, any capable provider of helping to keep patients in their home. Um, in addition, and probably the biggest ask is allowing to bill the Part B daily home infusion service fees, those G codes, G00686967 for Part, I'm sorry, 6869 and 70 for Part D drugs. And in essence, what that does is um, it really would help to provide comprehensive coverage for Part D drugs, which is one of our long term goals. And certainly, uh, I think, helpful in um, minimizing the need for beneficiaries to receive care in. One, skilled nursing facilities. Two, extended hospital stays. Three, traveling to hospital outpatient department or physician's office on a daily basis to get their infusions. And these are the choices that patients are faced with now. And, and with that very limited coverage in Part D only for the drug, the, the cost considerations of services, supplies, and equipment often drive beneficiaries to other sites of care, which are not the sites of care we want to be driving people to right now. Um, So from a future guidance standpoint, things are very fluid. They're changing um, day to day, literally hour to hour at times. And NHI will continue to track everything we can and get information out to folks. Um, in addition to the letter to HHS, we are working on a letter to private payers, um, really with the focus of removing prior authorizations uh, for home infusion services. Um, proof of delivery requirements or any signature requirements, limiting those and broadening their networks um, to allow for any willing provider, or at a minimum, not um, introducing policies that would limit networks, which I understand is something that Blue Cross Blue Shield Association um, is in the process of rolling out. So in addition to a general payer letter, we'll be generating a payer to Blue Cross Blue Shield Association about the the timing and um, and why they shouldn't be doing that at this time, really why they shouldn't do it at all, but especially at this time. So with that, I will turn it over to Connie Sullivan. All right, thank you so much, Bill. That was great information. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some operational preparedness and things that home infusion providers should be thinking about right now as you have some time to prepare your operation for what could be a major influx of patients. You can go into the next slide. Uh, so the message is, I'm sorry, go back one. Okay, thank you. Um, if you haven't already, uh, kind of garnered from the information presented on this uh, this slide deck, it's really obvious that everyone needs to start preparing an action plan for COVID-19. And that's regardless of what's currently happening in your state and regardless of how many um, positive uh, patients are being detected in your, in your current state. Even if you're not uh, severely impacted, there are things you can do in your operation, such as conserving uh, the PPE, so that it's available for others who really need it um, that are involved in direct patient care. Uh, as you're preparing these plans, you need to really consider who should be at the table. You need all your clinical uh, leaders, your technology support, 
uh, your, your human resources staff. This is going to impact businesses in some unprecedented ways. Uh, and so there's a lot to think about and, and you need to bring everyone involved just like you would in any other disaster preparedness plan. Um, on the slide here, there are just a few things to maybe start thinking about. Um, obviously, when it comes to staffing, your plan needs to think about what will happen if you have uh, illness within your own staff and you don't have everyone available to work in the operation, especially as you have uh, increased capacity. Um, think about what your plan would be is it, uh, for staff who might develop symptoms at work. Um, how will you isolate staff uh, if someone needed to be isolated uh, in your facility so they're not exposing others? Obviously, you have to integrate and change practices for people who might be working from home. So there's there are a lot to, a lot to think about and how do you just maintain your operation uh, when you may have uh, deficient staffing levels. Um, obviously, infection control and safety go without saying, um, but there are diff additional things to think about with uh, this particular pandemic and some of the social distancing recommendations that are being issued by governments. Um, so think about how you can communicate those things to your teams making sure they understand what those precautions are and how can you take those even within your workplace uh, for those that are coming into the office on a regular basis. Um, we've talked a lot about the PPE conservation. Obviously, as Abby said earlier, that clean room PPE should be reserved for hazardous drug compounding at this time. Uh, the USP guidance was uh, uh, very helpful in understanding what you can do if you can't obtain regular PPE, and even if you can, it uh, really should be reserved for, for hazardous drug compounding. Uh, and so start working on those alternate plans for instituting new practices in your clean room. Um, I would also, um, when it comes to PPE, it recommend that you reach out to your state uh, and local health department officials. Find out how your state is accessing stockpiles of PPE uh, and additional supplies and how those are being allocated. Communicate with them the need for home health providers to also have some allocation. Uh, it's going to be hard to get these items, and the sooner you communicate with them about your needs, uh, I think the, the more likely you are, you're going to be able to um, acquire some additional supplies when you need them. Um, also, I want to just mention suites. Um, think about your infusion suites, if you have those. Uh, how are you going to use those, and are you going to continue to use those? Uh, and if you are going to bring patients into your suite, uh, you should refer to the CDC guidelines for outpatient facilities and make sure you have the ability to contain someone who is showing symptoms from the, mo from the moment they enter your facility all the way through the facility. So really think about that infusion suite and, and understand the, the risks and the benefits of using it uh, when you have additional capacity pressure. Now you can go on to the next slide. I want to talk a little bit about nursing conservation strategies uh, because this is obviously um, the limiting factor for how many patients a home infusion provider can safely serve. And so it's, it's important to start thinking now about how you might be able to conserve your nursing resources and broaden your nursing uh, capacity. Um, so some things that you could consider are looking at the therapies that are very nursing time intensive. Uh, can you convert any of your IVIG patients to sub-QIG, for example? Uh, how could you institute some televisits or more uh, remote monitoring and remote teaching capabilities for patients that have simpler administration uh, uh, methods that they would be using? Um, I, this is not going to be business as usual, and so we have to start thinking a little more proactively now before the emergency might come to your area about how you can uh, support additional um, patients without having to send a nurse to the home as frequently as you might normally. Uh, think about leveraging highly skilled caregivers that you've been working with for a long time. Do you have very experienced patients on your census that uh, maybe have a caregiver that could learn to do additional things like change addressing, uh, and access device dressing? Um, partner with your home health agencies. Uh, many of the patients that we uh, might see in home infusion might be uh, older and qualifying under Part A home health benefit. And uh, if there's another nurse in the home, can you offer to train those nurses on some of the things that uh, they might need to know and, and can do while they're there for a patient that's uh, receiving a home infusion? Uh, next slide. Thank you. 
Um, regarding compounding considerations, I wanted to add on to a little bit of what Abby provided, which was excellent information about uh, how to change your operations in the clean room. But for home infusion providers, you're also going to need to be thinking about how you modify your beyond use dating for uh, home infusion compounded sterile products. Uh, in a hospital system or a doctor's office, um, where things are used more immediately from the time they're compounded, uh, shortening BUDs for home infusion will be more challenging. Uh, and obviously, since we're going to have less than ideal conditions in our clean room environments because of the lack of uh, garbing, uh, availability of garbing, you want to really be conservative with assigning beyond use dates. However, you also need to consider that shortening beyond use dates might also increase your staff workload. Uh, so they would have to be compounding things more frequently in order to go with shorter BUDs. Uh, so you're going to need to really weigh all these different considerations. Um, you also, if you're shortening BUDs, might require more frequent deliveries, which would expose your delivery staff potentially to patients more frequently. So, um, you know, really consider the compounding conditions you're working under. Uh, consider increasing the frequency of the cleaning in your uh, clean room areas and, and monitor it like you always would. Um, and understand what those conditions are and then be able to uh, respond appropriately with your beyond use dating strategy. Like Abby said, there is no one size fits all solution. There's no uh, clear guidance about what BUD would be appropriate under these conditions. You have to make those decisions as a, a an organization. Um, some things you could consider doing is looking at the complexity of some of the compounded sterile products you are making. Um, where it's possible, you may want to move over to premix products that don't require any compounding or go to binary connector devices that are, um, uh, you know, are a little less invasive from a compounding perspective. Um, the last thing to consider, obviously, is that we may also be dealing with a lot of drug shortages in the coming weeks and months. And so uh, waste is also a large concern when it comes to your compounding practices. So. Uh, a lot of considerations to keep in mind. Um, I would also just finally say if there are those on the call that are uh, working in more of a suite setting where you have a segregated compounding area set up for your clean room, I would not recommend using a segregated compounding area to compound uh, sterile products to be sent to patients to use at home and to be stored longer than the 12 hours uh, that the chapter currently recommends. So, um, you know, we really do need to rely on the facilities that we have in place that offer the additional protections of a full uh, anti-room and buffer room suite set up and the primary engineering controls to maintain the quality of compounded sterile products that we're making for home infusion patients. Uh, you can go to the next slide. And then finally, I just want to say, you know, as part of your planning for COVID-19, be ready to expect the unexpected. Uh, we have a lot of very uh, tried and tested uh, protocols for home infusion that we have, have served us very well in this industry. And, and we've developed a, a very strong safety track record in home infusion. And to the extent we can maintain that, we should absolutely try to do that. However, I think you also need to consider that if you're in an area that will be significantly impacted by COVID-19, uh, you may be challenged uh, to serve patients that uh, have less than ideal IV access, uh, maybe dealing with more peripheral lines or midlines when you would normally be able to have a PICC line inserted. Um, you may receive referrals from unfamiliar places and, and physicians who maybe are less familiar with home infusion protocols. Be ready to, to help those people through the process. Um, as Bill was discussing, we expect reimbursement policies could change both on the private side and on the in the, um, the Medicare sector. Hopefully, we will be able to access more um, create access for more patients. So as that policy changes, we obviously will be updating information for our members. Um, also, there will be unpredictability in the supply chain. So if you can't get the preferred item that is prescribed for a patient, be prepared to offer recommendations based on uh, all the other parameters uh, for that patient's particular therapy, home environment, and IV access. And then finally, you know, as new treatments are being explored, uh, make sure you're finding ways to stay up to speed, and NHA will be helping with that. Um, we, we know that there's a lot of information coming out at a very rapid pace right now. 
Um, this is a unprecedented situation and the information we're sharing today may not be uh, relevant or current tomorrow. And so our, uh, our goal is to keep our home infusion members updated as uh, quickly as we can. We've developed a COVID-19 resource center on the NHA website, and that's where we'll be uh, putting information as it becomes available. We will also schedule additional talk infusion webinars and be uh, using our uh, weekly newsletters and e-blasts uh, out to members to keep you informed of changes as they, as they occur. We would also really encourage you um, to communicate with us regarding challenges that you're facing. Uh, help us understand what you're seeing on the ground, uh, how NHIA can be helpful to you and uh, support you as you're dealing with a changing situation uh, around patient care. And then I would just like to also say that, you know, this is a time for our industry uh, to work together and to support each other. And uh, this is a time also to share information. And so to the extent that you can share the protocols and the strategies that you're developing to handle uh, surges in patients or challenges with shortages uh, or unique um, things that are coming up as you're uh, working to uh, protect your staff and, and uh, the frontline personnel, please share those things with us uh, so that we can help others be as prepared as possible during this really challenging time. So that concludes our webinar for today. Um, questions can be sent to our uh, info email address at nhia.org. And uh, again, we apologize for the technical difficulties and appreciate you uh, hopefully uh, concluding the webinar on the recording that we're sending out. Thank you all very much. Thank you.